Hi everyone, this is Scott and Hi, Katie. Katie. So I'm going to start by answering one of the questions that was sent to us. Someone wrote Katie and said, I have a question for you. I have a marriage question for you. Should a Christian wife who is married to a Christian husband do 100% of the spiritual training, Bible reading, Bible study with the children when a husband won't do it? Or do you think that it lets the husband off the hook? This is not the case of a wife thinking they can do it better or not making room for the husband to do it. The husband just won't do it. So let me provide a few verses first that even discuss the responsibility that rests on a father or a husband's shoulders. In Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, it says, These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now in these verses, um, there's no identification of fathers or mothers or men or women. It's just parents in general being told to do this. So first we can accept that this is a responsibility that is given to both parents. Set, but then in Ephesians 6, 4 in the New Testament, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So right there we have a clear command for fathers to be doing this instruction with their children. Proverbs is largely written as a father instructing his children, but especially instructing his son. And that would make sense because generally fathers are going to be the best instructors of sons. They're the ones who are going to be um, the best teachers as far as how a son can grow up to be a father and a husband, or who's better going to be able to talk to a son about growing up to be a man than his father. And so Proverbs is largely written as a father speaking to his son. Just for example, in Proverbs 1, verse 8, My son, hear the instruction of your father. Proverbs 1.10, My son, if sinners entice you. Proverbs 1.15, My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from the path. And just repeatedly, 24 times to be exact, in Proverbs, you've got a father speaking to his son. Now, the question you're asking about teaching your children, there, there is discussion in Proverbs, too, about mothers teaching their children. In Proverbs 1.8, it says, My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother, or the teaching or instruction of your mother. So you have a father who's supporting the teaching and instruction of his wife by telling his children to make sure that they don't ignore or neglect the teaching that they receive from her. And really, that's one of the best ways a father can support his wife is by making sure that his children are listening to their mother. Also, Proverbs 6.20 says the same thing. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. And so again, just that emphasis on the father supporting the, the mother and her teaching and instruction. Now, because so many, I, I suspect a number of the people listening might be homeschooling families, it's really easy for us as fathers or husbands to f feel like, well, our wives have it under control. They're the ones who are responsible. I'm working really hard all day, and, and you know, my wife is going to take care of the kids. She's homeschooling, and so I'll leave it up to her to perform this instruction. But Scripture clearly puts this responsibility in Ephesians 6, 4, and then, and then just mentioning those verses in Proverbs on the shoulders of of uh, fathers to do this. And so we do have a large responsibility in teaching and training our children, even if our wives are the ones who are staying at home and homeschooling them. Now your question, though, related, and I'm not, I don't know who you are, so I don't have a, a name for you or anything, but um, your question relates directly to a husband who will not perform any of this instruction. And should you do it, is that just taking it off the hook, taking it off, uh, taking your husband off the hook? And I would highly encourage you to do it. The reason is this. If you don't do it, then it might not get done. And if you're not doing it, I don't think that is going to encourage your husband to do it. If he thinks, in fact, I actually think there's a better chance of him being convicted and burdened to do it if he sees you doing it with the children. I think that'll provide an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to convict him when he sees this larger larger load that is on your shoulders. It'll, if he... I think it'll bother him that his wife is having to take on so much and do this and, and take a lot of the load that belongs to him. But if you forsake teaching and instructing your children too in the hope that it's going to make him feel ashamed or, or guilty, then I suspect he'll just look back and, and say, okay, well, this is great. She's not doing it either. Now I really don't have to worry about it. And so I just want to encourage you again. I don't, I don't know you, but, um, 
You've done a wonderful thing here. 1 Corinthians 7, it describes the benefit of children even being just with one saved parent. And so you did describe your your husband as a Christian, so your children are with two Christians. But even if even if one of them isn't uh, fulfilling his responsibility, it's sort of like they're they're just with one Christian. But so you are getting that sanctifying work that First Corinthians seven describes um, in teaching and in, in training your children. They do need that, and if you're not doing it according to what you're saying about your husband, then it's just not going to get done. If if you stop doing it, then then there won't be anyone doing it. Mm-hmm. And so I would I. I really admire what you're doing. I, um, my heart does go out to you that you have to do this without his support, but I hope you'll just keep praying and, and asking for strength from God and praying that God will convict your husband. And I do believe that most husbands, even if they pretend like they're not convicted or bothered, that they are going to feel very ashamed of being such a pathetic or lame husband when their wife is acting like such a godly woman. And according to first Peter 3.1, you're going to win over your husband with your godly conduct, not with your words. And so it's not about you trying to coerce him or talk him into it. It's just setting that wonderful example that you're doing. And so keep teaching and training your children and praying that God will give you the strength to do it without the help that you're receiving right now. And, and hopefully God will convict your husband to come alongside you. And if he does, then the best thing you can do at that time is just really encourage him and praise him and thank him for being a godly husband. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what was the name, Eunice, and what was the name of the other woman with, for Timothy? I think it just gave his grandmother. Anyways, there's women that are mentioned in the Bible for raising uh, godly m- men and doing a great job uh, leading them. So I take pleasure, too, in teaching my children the Bible every day. Even though Scott does most of the spiritual teaching, I'm thankful to invest in them that way as well. And I put up a poll earlier when I said that we were going to do this video, and I said... What are the most common or prominent issues in marriage? And I had finances as one, parenting as the second one, miscommunication as number three, in-laws and family as number four, and number five was opposite personalities. And what's really cool is no one said number four. So evidently none of you have any Mm -hmm. problems with your in-laws. We just all have great in-laws, so I'm happy to hear that, especially me. Right, Meme? I think you're watching. Okay, so... The most common ones were uh, number three, which is miscommunication. And um, yeah, they were kind of all over the place, except for no one said number four. And um, I think that all of these issues actually do stem from different personalities. For example, you have personalities who are frugal in their spending, and then you have some that are more indulgent. You have personalities who are more lenient in their parenting, and then some who are more strict. You have personalities that over-communicate, and then you have ones that just remain silent and apathetic and are like, stop talking to me. And then you, yeah, and then number five was opposite personality. So I have found that to be the basis for most marital strife. And um, thankfully, my husband wrote something about this in his book. What do you know? Um, in chapter 18 of his book, it's called the husband treats his wife well by dot, dot, dot. And this, one of the subsections is living with her according to knowledge. And this is <clears throat> from first Peter three, right? Mm-hmm. And first Peter three, seven, first Peter three, seven instructs husbands to live with their husband, to live with their wives according to knowledge or dwell with her in under, with understanding. So in his book on page 171, he says the word dwell or most translations say live, communicates being together physically, but it means more than just occupying the same house. It refers to a husband's making his wife his lifelong companion. Putting the words dwell and understanding together, the Apostle Peter commands husbands to develop knowledge of their wives and then live with them according to that knowledge. Husbands should take what they have learned about their wives and apply that knowledge or understanding to their daily lives with them. And so then he has a, like a personal story about how he's done that with me. My wife is a visionary. That's my personality type. Creative woman with lots of plans and ideas. She likes to think months, years, or even decades down the road. On the other hand, I, my husband Scott, generally has to focus one week at a time. 
just making it to Sunday. And he says, I count time by the number of days until the Lord's day arrives. When Sunday is over, the countdown begins again. As a result, Katie really appreciates it when I listen to all of her plans and ideas, no matter how far they are in the future. And then he says, most strengths have a corresponding weakness. So even though Katie has lots of plans, she also has trouble finishing things she starts. And some of her favorite words to say to herself come from Ecclesiastes 7, 8. The end of a thing is better than its beginning. Because Katie knows this about herself, she's asked me to do two things for her. Number one, I ask him to encourage me to finish things that I start. And I ask him to discourage me from starting new things. And so even though this, he addressed this to husbands, wives can do this as well because we're called to submit and we're called to adapt to our husbands. So, for example, um, just Scott and I's personality. You want to show you two so you can share? So our personality differences, just to kind of give you an idea, like I just shared, we're total different and my visionariness and my new ideas and exciting let's talk about things 20 years from now and he's like why do we need to talk about this so that's one difference um go ahead one difference is actually these live videos that you're watching <laughs> just to let you know i'm really uncomfortable doing this and my wife's been surprised and i think even my kids are surprised you know how do you get up every sunday and preach to 300 something people and you're not nervous and i'm really not very nervous preaching but this environment is super uh, nerve-wracking for me. And the reason is when I preach, I'm, I've got these notes in front of me. I've labored all week over my sermon. I've got it down to like the word that I'm going to say. Whereas this is live and there could be mistakes or who knows what's going to happen. And, and so to me, it's, I'm very uncomfortable doing something that I'm not thoroughly prepared for. We even started it, said we we're going to do it at 8.30 and we did it at 8.34 because I was still trying to copy down these verses. And I actually would have probably liked about another five minutes or two hours <laughs> and so whereas katie's like let's just do it let's just do it just start the start the live video and then uh she almost it's almost like she thinks we're going to figure out this live video as we do it whereas i just want to plan out every single detail for it and so even watching this live video you're seeing one of the real differences in our personalities but i'm trusting that god wants to stretch me and use my wife to do that and so you should see as we discuss these live videos you can recognize my uh my hesitation Katie says, no, no, we can do this. You do a great job when you get questions. Sunday school is the environment I teach where I'll get questions that I have to answer on my feet. Obviously, people aren't asking me questions when I'm preaching. Sunday school or a midweek study, I'll receive questions, though. And Katie says, you know, you just pretend like you're doing something like that. And so, uh, yeah, better to come from the heart anyway. Someone, just, My friend Dusty just offered that. And, and so anyway, this just definitely reveals one of the differences between us. You can, you might notice how comfortable my wife is doing this. She doesn't like the preparation as much. She just wants to kind of <laughs> go for it. So, yes. oh, and by the way, it's, uh, in, in second Timothy one, five, it mentions Lois and Eunice. So Lois I think that's what Katie was asking about earlier. Lois and Eunice or Timothy's mother and grandmother who are, who are wonderful influences on Timothy. Paul even credited them with the way that Timothy turned out. And so the woman who sent us that question, you might read second Timothy 1 5 and just be encouraged by the wonderful women that um, raised Timothy and the, and the great influence they had on him and then the wonderful man that they were able to produce their effort within the absence of some man contributing to Timothy's spiritual upbringing. So I hope that might be an encouragement to you. One of my favorite, all time favorite marriage quotes. You guys got your paper and pencil here? This is awesome. He would sit down with people for premarital counseling and he'd say, okay. You are incompatible. It is what you do with that incompatibility that will determine the joy or lack of joy in your marriage. So everyone is incompatible. So it makes me sad when I hear people like getting divorced. Like we just, you know, we weren't meant for each other. Or they say we had irreconcilable differences. And one pastor said, we, my wife and I have been having irreconcilable differences for 20 years. And so it's like, we all are so different. And we're coming together to live under one roof. Like one person said in the comment section when I put up the question for the poll earlier, she said, people are attracted to opposites, then they get married, and those things drive them crazy. And I'm sure everyone watching this can relate. Like, I think Scott liked the spontaneity about me or like fly by the seat of my pants kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. He did like that. But then when it, two become one flesh and I'm like, okay, let's just do this or let's just do that. And he's like, no, let's sit down and plan out Everyone what we're going to do sense. and let's do every detail. And I, meanwhile, I'm like, oh my goodness, how many details do we need to talk about? 
So something we've had to do in our marriage is just adapt to one another. And I love that verse in Romans that says, outdo one another with honor. And so we're trying to seek to understand the other person. But overall, I do think the wife is called to adapt to the husband. That's what the word says. So for example, my husband is the most efficient person you'll ever meet, and I am the least efficient person. So I have had to seek to adapt to that. Um, and I think if it's not sinful, you should adapt. Some women are the opposite. So some women marry someone like me, a Mr. Visionary guy that's like all over the place. And she's a detail oriented like person. And then she has to adapt to him. It's not sinful for him to want to do exciting things or um, be a visionary. So it's just that's something we should be doing with each other, adapting. Like I read earlier from Scott's book. You have to dwell with your wife in understanding if you're a husband, seeking to know her and see what she's like. But overall, the wife should be adapting to the husband. Did you have a thought? No, not really. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, we did get something else. Oh, Melanie. Okay, well, I'll, I'll okay go ahead. Add, I will add one thing. Katie read 1 Peter 3, 7. It talks about a husband dwelling with his wife with understanding or knowledge. And so what that means is a husband is expected to learn his wife. He's to develop this knowledge of her and then live with her in an understanding way or live with her according to that knowledge. And so just even though a wife is identified as her husband's helper, and Katie is talking about the way that a wife is then to adapt to her husband, a husband also is expected to learn his wife and live with her according to that knowledge or live with her according to what he's learned. And so there's a sense in which a husband is somewhat adapting to his wife, embracing her um, strengths and her weaknesses and learning how best he can love and support her. Katie mentioned a few of those things just in the passage that she read from my book. So it's, it's really very mutual regarding the learning and adapting to each other and finding out how best you can help each other. Yeah. And one other personality thing you guys might be able to re relate to is um, Scott's very thorough in how he speaks and talks probably goes with the detail thing. And I'm like, come on, chop, chop, chop in a lot of things in life. So I don't do things well. I'm like, let's just get through this. And so even when we're talking sometimes, I can feel inside of myself like, okay, come on, come on, what's your point? And it comes across as disrespectful. So if you are a husband married to a woman maybe who is more detailed or you're a wife married to a husband who just wants to go into the detail, don't disrespect them by, you know, cutting them off. Okay, okay, I get it, I get it. Trying to understand that person has really helped me. So, for example, I'm like, okay, Scott, this helps him to be able to finish his thoughts. To So I just sit there and wait for him to finish. And it really helps him to feel respected and, right? Yes, very much. He said yes, very much. So anyways, if you guys don't have any other questions, um, feel free to message us or you can comment even now with one. Uh, we really have a burden and a heart for marriage, mm -hmm. and it saddens us to think about all the people that are just miserable in marriage. Scott really is my best friend. We have plenty of personality differences, and because of our love for Christ overall, we are trying to work through those things to glorify and honor him. Mm -hmm. And it is possible to do that. And even if you're the only one in the relationship that's seeking the Lord, God can still work through that. Don't feel like, oh, all this is pointless because my husband's not a Christian or my wife doesn't really love the Lord. The Lord can still work through you, like Scott mentioned earlier, being a sanctifying influence on your spouse. So don't give, get up, give up. And someone just said, Scott, earlier, Katie mentioned the typical marital pitfalls, but what advice do you have? with regards to blended families? Okay, so I can only assume that means uh, man and woman who have children um, but don't belong to both of them. And so there's a few variables. If the child has grown up knowing, you know, the, the stepfather for most of his life or only for a few years. Um, so it's hard to just answer this in a real blanket way, but I would say this. Generally, you're going to, this is going to be more determined by the children and the way that they embrace the uh, the, step, the step parents. I don't think that people should strive to force themselves into a child's life. It's um, a love and an appreciation that has to be earned through, as the child recognizes your affection for them and sees your sacrifice for them. And so it's really the question that's asked is actually more one that the children have to answer regarding how they embrace that, that parent, how comfortable they are with hugs and holding hands and, 
um, saying I love you or calling you mother or father. Okay, so specifically regarding those step roles. So I'll just say this. When I taught elementary school, I know this is a somewhat far extreme from being a step parent, but you're receiving these children into your life. And you can tell there's some kids who want to hug you on the first day. And then, then there's other kids who look at you with real app apprehension and skepticism. The wrong way to approach any of those children who have a real skepticism would be to try to hug them or get them to embrace you or accept you without having invested that amount of time and energy in patiently waiting for them to um, come to that point. So just for an example, let's say one of these children comes to the class one day and they, you can tell they've got a haircut. And so if you knew a child really well, you might say, oh, I love your haircut. Your haircut looks really great. When it's a child who's really apprehensive or skeptical, you would say something along the lines of, I noticed you got your haircut. And then you watch the child to see the sort of response that that child gives. Does the child want to talk to you about their haircut? Does the child want to engage you? And maybe not that day, in which case you don't push and pry and, and try to force a discussion with that child when he or she isn't interested you give it time, and then after a few weeks or a few months, or if it's a stepchild, maybe even a few years, that child's ready to have that conversation that they weren't ready to have before. But it's just kind of floating out these ideas. It's floating out the opportunities for that child to um, hug or embrace, and it's earning through the time invested in that child's life, um, that child's confidence and that child's respect. But it's just not something that can be forced, and it's, it's not something that you want the parent of the child even to try to encourage. Um, it's something that you want that child to come to of his or her own volition. Okay, uh, one more thing from Scott's book that is addressed to the husband since I address, oh wait, ad, yeah, for the husbands, um, again, adapting to their wives. It's on page 102 and it says, how does a wife, or sorry guys, it's, it's a wife adapting to her husband because that's what the Bible says. And um, so it says, how does a wife adapt to her husband? By learning what is important to him and making it important to her. Is your husband punctual? Work hard to be on time. Does he have to be up early and wants to be in bed by a certain time? Then work hard to be in bed on time. Does it bother him when certain things are messy or left out? Try to make sure that those areas are tidy. In other words, work hard to make your husband's priorities your own and put your priorities second. So that's just another way, again, to adapt to your husband's personality. So thanks for watching tonight. We have a Christmas special that we're letting you guys know about first in Scott's book. Um, we're going to do two books for $24.99, and that includes shipping. So if you went through Amazon, it's $32 with shipping. And so this is a great deal. You can message Scott afterwards if you're interested. It's always better to get mm -hmm. two books so that you and your husband or wife can go through it together and say, man, Give did you read that gift. on page 103? And so we just want it to be a, um, a great Christmas gift that you can give to married couples. Because like I said, marriage is such a gift and too many people are experiencing something miserable and we want them to have that gift and so yep christmas special you can just message scott and let him know you'd like to do that for $24.99 including shipping and again feel free to message us about any marriage questions you guys have all right thanks for tuning in god bless you guys we're praying for you and your relationship with your spouse and your relationship with christ all right dusty good to see you god bless you guys okay we hear no it's still screaming bye still guys on. for real bye <laughs>